Welcome back. We're, we're going to go into a, a final short session uh, where uh, we're going to ask uh, all of our uh, guests uh, some questions. And, and I've got a, a, a few from uh, the studio audience here. And since I am up here, I have the prerogative actually to ask my own question. So I want to plant the question because these questions, by the way, are going to be questions that all of you are going to answer. So think of this as a lightning round. If you start the filler bust, I will cut you off just to understand this. Um, so all these questions are for all of you, but I want to plant uh, my question uh, to you right now, which is you've been here for about uh, two days, and I'd be curious to hear um, uh, a surprise that you'd care to share. Uh, I'm hoping that, why is that funny? <laughs> I think that's a good question. So, so um, I'm thinking that it would be probably in relation to maybe one of the other uh, presentations or other stimulation from the campus. You also engage with students, which the audience and myself didn't have a chance to participate, so maybe you want to share something from that. But anyway, I want you to be thinking about something that you'd like to share that was a little bit surprising or interesting or thought-provoking or, or a connection that you, you hadn't seen before uh, from, from your time here. So that's what they're going to be uh, thinking about, and I'm just going to stall for a second to give them a chance. And I've got a bunch of questions from you, and I've selected... Uh, two of the excellent questions that we will ask all our participants uh, as well. So that's the plan for this session. And I want to now start with the surprises. And would anyone like to volunteer to start? We've got two microphones. You have to share microphones, by the way. Would anyone like to volunteer to start? So, okay. So, Kevin, do you want to start? You're live. I'll, I will start. Um, cu couple, two, maybe three, if I can think of them all, uh, reflections on, on uh, the, the past couple of days. Firstly, as someone who really hadn't heard of Southwestern University, uh, a year, nine months ago when Ben Pierce sent the invitation, being marooned up in the northeast of the USA for the last 10, 20 years, um, it's been a wonderful experience coming here and meeting so many. The, the students that I had lunch with yesterday and have met in the evening sessions uh, have been just uniformly brilliant, engaging, forward-looking. It's really a, tr a testament to all of the teaching that you do or used to do. Um, and I want to congratulate the whole people, everybody inv involved in this enterprise. So, so well done, everybody. Um, the presentation that we heard from Peter uh, this morning on neglected tropical diseases, I think, shamed many of us, certainly shamed me, for not knowing virtually every statistic that he rolled out. I do remember seeing films as a student back in England in high school of elephantiasis. We, we got plenty of lectures on that, and then you conveniently put that to one side. Um, and we may talk about more about how we can get that word out. Uh, my other takeaway is I am going on that pilgrimage in northern Spain, the next opportunity I can possibly find. That looked brilliant. Great. Patricia? Um, boy, mine is going to sound almost like an echo of yours. Sorry to be the parrot, but um, in meeting with the students, uh, doing uh, studio critiques and also in the f uh, feedback, on my uh, gallery talk and uh, visiting with the classes the day before as well. Um, really, really um, t t took my breath away, the students that I met with, just in terms of the, the um, extended intellectual and creative reach that they had across campus, the ideas that they were engaging. Um, what a terrific uh, set of programs that you have here. And I too will uh, say that it was the N7 that really um, was, was um, very surprising. I was embarrassed to say I didn't know more that there was that there were even there was this cluster of seven. But what was really stunning about it was the lack of sort of celebrity or political uh, support for this. Um, I, 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 in a way, I sort of thought, well, you know, maybe I've been spending too much time in the studio, which is why I don't know about it. But the fact that you can't actually get um, you know bigger name people to really get behind this as uh, uh, as a way of sort of addressing the issue was was equally. Um, Disturbing. Yeah. Anne. Um, first of all, thank you for having me here. I'm really going to sound like an echo of an echo now, but everyone that I've met here has been curious and brilliant and wonderful to talk to, so thank you very much for having me here. Probably the most surprising thing that I heard at the Brown Symposium was the presentation on tropical diseases. I was shocked that I didn't know the majority of the diseases that he was talking about and how diseases this common barely anyone knows about and have barely any support. I was also really 
surprised about the slow medicine as compared to fast medicine approaches to medicine. And when I went to see my doctor and tell him that I had my genome sequence, the response I got was, what'd you do that for? <laughs> and I think it would have been really useful to apply slow medicine in that case and talk to my doctor about the contents of my genome, both what I had to be worried about and watch out for versus what I needed to be less worried about. Great. Let's go to Peter. Actually, we'll keep that microphone kind of with the three of you. That's your mic, but we'll go to Peter. Okay. Uh, well, nothing terribly, terribly original. First of all, in addition to the students being so engaging, the faculty were very engaging at, uh, here at uh, Southwestern. And I was struck how beautiful the campus is. And, uh, and this is what it's like in the dead of winter and probably the coldest day in, of the year. <laughs> uh, I can only imagine how wonderful this place must be in the spring and in the fall. And so I think you're very lucky to be able to work in such uh, beautiful and gracious uh, surroundings. It's a magnificent campus, both in terms of the people and in terms of the physical facilities. I think the, the other point that I did want to make, which hasn't been raised before, is you know how rapidly the genomics and genetics testing is advancing, and it's just occurring at a breathtaking uh, speed. And we, we've had a little chance to talk about this with uh, Dr. Davies before. But one of the concerns I have is it also could create a, an even greater health disparity than we have now, because it's going to further separate the haves from the have-nots, mm -hmm. those who have access to you know, having their entire genome sequenced for a few hundred bucks versus, you know, people uh, living in poverty and uh, it's going to further emphasize. So there, I think there's something I think would be a very rich discussion uh, and investigation would be the, the ethics of, of, of all of this that's happening right now and, and how this is going to advance in the coming years. Great. Victoria. <clears throat> Let's see now. I think I should say that the first thing that surprised me was when I was picked up in the car by Maria Juevis, and she told me about this Paideia program you guys have started and explained it to me. And I was just blown away. We had a whole hour and a half to talk or so till I got here. And it's something I've been thinking about a lot. And the fact that you guys are doing something this complicated, this, as far as I know, completely unusual. Uh, really impressed me and surprised me. So that would be the first thing. And uh, the second thing I have to tell you, I'm totally surprised at the quality of the food. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I just had a wonderful time. Uh, and, and really the third thing, and I'm echoing everybody here, is how cold it is <laughs> and how warm everybody is. I have felt so taken care of and so stimulated. And once again, I have this wonderful sense about this coming generation who is going to surprise everyone by the maturity, I think. And I speak as a baby boomer, as a part of the narcissistic, immature, eternal teenage generation. And I'm so happy this group is moving into place. Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I will not repeat what has already been said. Um, I actually felt like this is pretty warm <laughs> compared to where I was coming from. Um, but I guess what, what I really like about my visit was the sense of both community and sort of a buzz that things are happening. That that. I, I mean, I visit a lot of schools and, you know, people go to classes and they kind of, you know, the faculty kind of come into work and they're kind of like, well, the, but I never got that sense here. I think there's a sense of like, really, the potential is, is already happening here. And, and I, I just think this seems like a wonderful place to be. I would, at least that was the impression I got from students. And I think, you know, all of us are going to be sort of ambassadors for Southwestern for life, just because we've sort of seen it. Good. Thank you. Okay, uh, I want to now turn to your questions, and so uh, I want to have two representative questions from the, uh, from the studio audience here, and if we have time afterwards, 
uh, I will give you a chance to question each other. So if you have questions that you'd like to ask each other, uh, if we have time, uh, I'll uh, see if we can work that in. But, but these are the questions that the audience has for all of you. Uh, and so the first question is, what do you think your field will look like in 20 years? Which I think is a great question. So whoever asked that, that was brilliant. And uh, I will actually pick the people who will go for, I'll just kind of do the order at random. And we'll start with actually Victoria. We'll start with you and then we'll go from there. So the question is, what do you think your field would look like in 20 years? It'll be on, yes. Oh, did he turn it off? These Dartmouth people always start turning things off. <laughs> Stalling here. There we go, <laughs> energy conservation. Wow, that is such a question. In 20 years, well, you know, when, one of the things I've noticed is that whenever people predict, they always predict from where we are, and they predict the present into the future, and they're usually wrong. So doing that, um, predicting the present into the future, I have a, what, I'm, what I'm sensing that there's is like a pull going on right now. Um, and when I gave the talk yesterday, I talked about the pendulum that swung so far away from the personal to the efficient. And I do have a sense, a uh, very strong sense, from the reaction to my book and speaking and emails and notes and letters I get and just the whole response is that this pendulum is ready to swing back from the efficient to the personal. And it is, in fact, swinging back. But at the same time, it's also swinging the other way. There's like these two magnetic poles is how I feel it. One is to the more and more techno technical, technological, uh, controlled, organized, and a completely opposite pull in this so fast medicine, let's say, and this opposite pull in a completely different direction. And I think, and I don't know what's gonna happen, but what I imagine happening is we will actually end up, um, it, it reminds me of when we had two magnets when we were a kid and they first showed us magnets. We put those iron filings on top of the paper and what you ended up seeing is a bunch of filings around one and a bunch of filings and you had this sort of only a little bit in the middle and that that's what we're going to end up with. We're going to end up with a group that's more, mostly slow medicine with some fast medicine and then a very, I'm sorry to say, rigid technical with all these wonderful genomics where you do stick your finger in a computer and you get diagnosed. And I think we're going to see two separate, um, help me out here mathematically, those two, two Venn, a Venn, a Venn diagram, diagram that, yes. that doesn't have too much in the middle. Great. Uh, Kevin, uh, what do you think your field's going to look like in 20 years? I gave some sort of pointers uh, to this yesterday. I think one thing we haven't talked a whole lot about here, uh, not quite within the scope of the program, but just the the progress that is being made in drug discovery and drug development. Big Pharma, and I'm guilty of this sometimes, can get a very bad rap. Uh, some of the things they do in terms of not publishing and releasing all their data is not necessarily strictly ethical. Uh, but the innovation, we need drug companies to provide drugs that we take uh, that, uh, that Peter and others have been talking about. And the innovation that we see, you have a little cluster of innovation, uh, comp small companies, startups being incubated here uh, in Georgetown uh, and in Texas and obviously on the two coasts in San Francisco and Boston. That's going to be sort of the lifeblood for the new drugs, the new targeted, personalized drugs uh, that we can give to cancer patients and, and with a whole other slew of diseases uh, as well. Um, it's difficult to jump the time frame of my talk yesterday was 20 years. It's almost impossible to hazard a guess where we'll be in 20 years, but I think uh, you and your, your kids and your relatives, you'll have your genome on your iPhone. You'll be looking up, just as Anne can do right now, <laughs> trailblazer that she is. I think everyone will have access to that information. I don't see any reason why you, a universal screening of co a complete genetic profile um, that would be stored in your electronic medical record wouldn't be feasible. It's not the technology that's going to prevent this from happening. It's going to be reimbursement and privacy concerns, and it's going to be the economics of all this that's going to be the issue. But uh, really, I think the sky's the limit. Thank you. Uh, Jonathan, 20 years from now, what's your field going to look like? I'm one of the few here who can remember what it was 20 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, my impression of economics is that it's working, it's more and more working with, with uh, other fields. It's kind of becoming diffuse. Um, some of our economists are uh, 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 working, uh, you know, 
looking at, uh, at, at the GWAS, looking at genetic uh, information. Others are working with uh, uh, brain scientists, and, uh, and that's a good thing. Uh, but I think, there, I think one thing that's not going to go, going to go away is this uh, problem of opportunity cost, of thinking about how best to spend money where there are very, always competing wants. And I think I'm hoping that will ensure that if I'm still working then that I still might have a job. So. <laughs> And what will you be doing in 20 years? And tell us about your field at that time. Um, I am not sure what I will be doing in 20 years, but I hope it involves both scientific research and scientific communication, because the scientific community definitely needs to get better at helping the public understand the sorts of research that they're working on. And where I think genomics research is going to go from here is, I think there are going to be fewer GWAS or fewer studies associating genetic variants directly with phenotypes, and I think there are going to be a lot more studies of what goes on in between. So now that you can associate genotypes with phenotypes in several areas, I think you're going to be looking at how the gene produces certain proteins, and if something goes wrong, how you can work with the biological mechanism in the middle to cure genetic disorders more effectively and directly. Wonderful. Peter, 20 years from now. So I'm going to answer that in two parts. The first part is uh, with regard to the uh, field of scientific research, and especially medical research. Uh, in the United States, I'm very worried about the absence of public-private investments in our biomedical research enterprise. We've had now a flatline budget at the NIH for over a decade, which effectively means we're, we're giving out $1998. Uh, so we've lost a lot of ground, and the practical effect of that is it's gotten extremely hard to uh, secure government funding for research. So uh, 10 years ago, your chances of getting an NIH grant were one in three. Now they're less than one in 10. Mm -hmm. And people like myself, you know, we're savvy enough. We know enough people that we can kind of make up some of that from other high net worth individuals or other private investments. But a young person starting out in science is looking at uh, something very sobering. And uh, we're seeing a dropout in a number of young scientists going into biomedical research. So that's a long way of saying that I fear that unless there's a change, and I think there still could be a change, it's not too late, uh, we're going to see the loss of a generation of scientists in the United States and a loss of scientific ascendancy. So where is that going to happen? Well, we're already seeing now a reverse brain drain back to China. Uh, China's uh, investing in science like there's no tomorrow, recruiting young scientists back. We're seeing a lot of international scientists go to China, go to Singapore. And so that's, that's a great concern because, you know, what, is, what, what makes our country great? Well, there are a number of things, but one of them is people have a respect of our universities, of our scientific research institutions and that could melt away, and so that will uh, reduce our ability to project power, so it ultimately becomes a security issue as well. In terms on the health front, um, I kind of alluded to it in my talk. I think we're starting to see a blurring of what used to, we used to consider global health and what used to be considered first world medicine, and there are a number of forces at work, so that will be very interesting to see what the United States looks like in 20 years in terms of healthcare delivery and uh, p potentially a, a similarity with India and Indonesia. Great. Patricia. Um, well, the arts, uh, you know, they certainly run concurrent and keep their fingers on the same pulse as the rest of contemporary culture. So uh, in the same way that we live in certain cultural conditions here in the United States where there's a big division between the, the haves and the have-nots, unfortunately, the the, uh, the ever disappearing of the middle class, I think that we're going to see something very similar in, um, in, in, um, in what happens within the arts. And, and of course, the arts exist both within the academy and outside of the academy. So if the education model moves towards the STEAM model, where art is, um, 
you know, art is part of the, uh, the public school system, then you'll certainly see uh, the field of art uh, continuing to be um, um, thriving within the university systems. And um, I'm on a national task force now uh, producing case-making documents that uh, are trying to articulate the intrinsic value of art making uh, within the research institutions. So, um, so outside the institution, you'll still have these mega markets where certain people will be making an enormous amount of money on the stock market. This is where it gets back into the sort of plutocracy idea where there will be these you know, incredible haves. The have-nots will be working more in a sort of DIY um, kind of capacity. And uh, there will be, I think, a, a continued blurring of the boundaries between the arts and other disciplines. So where we see uh, movements such as citizen science uh, cropping up, which is um, uh, a movement that a lot of artists are involved in where um, data is being produced through, for example, crowdsourcing and sort of DIY experiments. Um, I think that there's gonna be a real blurring of the boundaries and we'll be moving uh, ever more towards a kind of a set of participatory aesthetics. One more point, if we do go towards the STEAM model, there's a lot of focus, a lot of intellectual work and a lot of creative work being done around the territory of women in technology. Um, and the STEAM model tends to uh, create pathways for women to actually go into the sciences through the arts. So if we go towards the STEAM model, um, the arts will actually start to provide new pathways for women to go into the sciences. So. Thank you. So we had a question about the future, and now uh, basically the, the next question that we have from the audience is about how do we get there, and so it's about change, which is one of my favorite topics, and here's the question from the audience. What changes would make interdisciplinary collaborations more conducive to solving modern healthcare problems? So the idea is getting more collaboration in an interdisciplinary fashion, and what changes could we make to, to um, entice that to make it more conducive to solving some of the problems that were presented uh, at the symposium? That's, that's a tough one. I think that's hard. Don't you think that's a hard one? I think that's hard, but luckily we have this panel here, so we don't have to do it, because <clears throat> I don't have the answer to that one. Uh, let's see, uh, why don't we start with uh, Jonathan. <laughs> Jonathan, so what changes would make interdisciplinary collaborations more conducive to solving some of these modern healthcare problems? So, um, I think that there's sort of two levels. One is a lot of the research and a lot of the work is done within universities where there are often silos or specific departments and um, one of the reasons why I have stayed like Dartmouth is because it's a small enough institution that you don't have these problems where somebody if you have an appointment in the medical school you're not allowed to teach in the College of Arts and Sciences or things these crazy rules at schools that I will not whose name I will not mention uh, <laughs> where, where there really are these kinds of restrictions so I think there is a general recognition now that big science re requires people from across disciplines and not especially, you know, the, the, the nanotechnologist talking about, well, phys physics, chemistry, I mean, it's like, it's all the same. Mm -hmm. You need mathematicians, you need physics, physicists, you need chemists. And by the same token, you know, Peter even has to call up economists. Um, but uh, to, to help him with his work. But I think the, 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 there is actually a, my sense of interdisciplinary work, at least with my experience, is that it requires an investment on the part of the individual. When I started working with the physicians, the wonderful physicians at Dartmouth, I realized I didn't understand what they were talking about, so I applied for a K award from NIH, and I spent a year in medical school and basically learned the language. And so after that, I could kind of understand what they were talking about and could read the literature. And I think if there's a common question that everybody is working on, then it's worth making the investment. If you just put a bunch of different disciplines together in the same building, that's not gonna work because they're not working on the same question. And this is one place where I think healthcare, it is an overriding question and it does get people to work together across disciplines. Great. And you're probably the resident expert on this because you are still engaged in your undergraduate studies, and, and you are doing interdisciplinary work because you're majoring in psychology and also majoring in Spanish. So from your vantage point, 
Uh, how can we uh, use interdisciplinary collaborations more effectively to, to help some of these things? I think in terms of personal genomics and how you can make personal genomics actually serve health, there needs to be a lot more interdisciplinary collaboration between scientists and doctors. I have met some incredible people, such as a medical geneticist named Dr. Joseph Thackeria, who does run a medical genetics clinic and is able to recommend genetic tests to people who come to him with certain disorders. But for the most part, going back to a doctor who used to be my personal caregiver, I had my genome sequenced, what'd you do that for? Do you want to hear about it? No. Going back to that, I think that the, that doctor's main problem wasn't an unwillingness to learn, it was that he did not have time to learn about whole genome sequencing and the impact that it could have. And to be fair, at the time, not many people were getting whole genome sequencing. He probably hadn't had any patients who'd done 23andMe testing before. But he also didn't have the free time in order to be able to learn about what that technology was in order to be able to consult with patients. So something else I learned at the Brown Symposium, Victoria brought up the point that doctors really don't have enough free time to be able to consult with patients for longer, but also don't have enough free time to read new papers about new technologies and new developments that might be able to help some of their patients a lot better. Great. Victoria, so what changes would make interdisciplinary collaborations more conducive to solving some of these modern problems? Well, I've done a lot of, of thinking about this, in part because I am a practicing physician and um, I do read these papers, and sometimes I read these papers and listen to talks, and it, there seems to be a complete disconnect between what I know on the ground dealing with patients and what this person is proposing. So I started thinking about this particularly a couple of years ago when the New England Journal of Medicine came out with an article, and it said that doctors and medical students really need to, un in order to get control of costs, we uh, need to understand what things cost. So that kind of made sense, you know, that how much something it costs, MRI and yada down, and that medical students should be, take a class in healthcare economics. But the thing is, what struck me about that was I felt that the New England Journal was under a misapprehension that doctors and medical students have any, or very little control about what's really going on, partly because of all the changes that you've heard, particularly what uh, Dr. Skinner was uh, talking about, and I thought really what I saw was the opposite need, and that was for the people who are making policy, the healthcare economists, the uh, sociologists, the medical anthropologists, that group of people, they need to understand what really happens on the ground. And many of those people, especially when they first start out, have never been in a hospital, mm -hmm. have never been sick, they're in their 20s, a lot of their parents haven't been sick, they, they don't really know anything. And that if we try and have an interdisciplinary um, collaboration, when people are in their 40s and 50s, forget it. We need to start really early, which is one of the reasons I was so taken by this paideia. Not to pitch your own thing back to you, but... Oh, you can go ahead, really pitch. Really struck right. by it. <laughs> because it gets everybody uh, at this stage, and I, I've been actually talking with Stanford, where I live, actually, down there, is about, my idea is to get the PhD students, for instance, because these are the people that are gonna go ahead and be making policy about genomics, about art and medicine, about um, every, everything you've heard about. They're the ones who are gonna be making policy, and we need to catch them young. So I've had an idea that, now I'm gonna actually pitch this idea and see what you all think, but we don't have that much time, but, I've had this sort of maybe idealistic idea that if I had a group, let's say at Stanford, of first year PhD students in all these different places, and we had a symposium, uh, we had a class, seminar really, where these students actually had their ideas for their dissertation, what they, how they wanted to change things, but they also had to um, get patients of their own, maybe two patients, and during the course of their PhD, follow these patients as real human beings in the healthcare system. And at the end of their PhD, whatever they proposed, in some appendix, they had to have some thoughts about how their big old policy ideas would affect, you know, Mr. Ramirez and Mrs. Chow. Um, and I think it's that kind of thing that has to happen early, 
We have to connect up. We have to get out of the silos from the beginning. Because once you're in that silo, it rem I'll, and I'll end here, I don't, I'm sh if anybody ever remembers, there was this fantastic Twilight Zone <laughs> episode with a bunch of dolls in a silo who are al alive. Do you remember that one? And they can never crawl out. They're, they keep trying to crawl up. And that's a little bit how, how the silo problem feels to me. You all remember that. Great. So Peter, Peter, please. Uh, what changes would make interdisciplinary collaborations more conducive to solving modern healthcare problems? So uh, medical schools are, thank you for that question. Medical schools are like what Churchill said about democracies, the worst form of governance you could possibly ever imagine except maybe for all the others, but the, <laughs> the, um, the, the, we have a real problem in medical education in the U.S. It is extremely siloed. If medical school deans could, they would dig moats around the medical school so nobody, nobody could get in and out, and, and, and that has to change. Uh, I've already talked to you about, at least for solving global health problems, we need the social scientists in a big way. We also need the physicists and the and the part and people working on things like nanoparticles. Health is is as interdisciplinary a problem as you could possibly imagine. And I don't really know an easy way to do it. I think we have a very powerful uh, accrediting body for medical education called the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges, and the LCME. I think we need to get them to change. I think we need to figure out a way to get medical students and other health professionals, I don't just mean medical students, nurses, back onto liberal arts colleges like this. You know, get them back for part of their last year and start talking to different people. It has to be better integrated uh, as part of their education. I don't know universities that do a very good job of this. One of them is kind of an intriguing model is uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has something called the Medical Scholars Program where uh, they pretty much require, and if you're part of this program, in some cases to even get a PhD in the humanities to, or to go back to the main arts and sciences campus and spend a significant amount of time there. Uh, that's just one small piece of it, but uh, we, need, we need to get, as you, as you rightly point out, we need to get to people when they're very young and get to have them change their thinking before, before all the synapses form and all the neur neuronal connections form. Thank we need you. to get them back thinking about things beyond the traditional medical school model, which was really the 19th century German model that was carried over by, by Flexner, who made, did a lot of good things in infusing science into medical education. It, it, it's gone in a way, though, that I think is uh, it's, it's missing out on, on an enormous amount of intellectual activity that goes beyond medical schools. Patricia, what changes would make interdisciplinary collaborations more conducive to solving some of these issues? Well, that's a really interesting and complex question. Um, I mean, certain universities um, are already uh, getting the, the reach of art out across campus and actually getting campus to uh, engage the arts. It's actually a pretty easy argument to make that uh, creativity enhances the other disciplines. I think most other people across campus agree on this. Uh, it's a harder argument to build what are the actual intrinsic uh, values of, um, of a studio practice. So um, uh, all that said, that there tends to be recognized, at least from the art side, that there's art and then there are these other sides. In my experience, uh, the most effective uh, kind of interdisciplinary, cross-disciplinary or transdisciplinary projects begin first with the institution defining what those three terms mean for themselves. And then um, something I've thought on a lot about and that I've done my best to form in the institutions where I've taught is to build agnostic spaces. And those are spaces that are owned by nobody and that serve everyone. And that means if it's not a technology center cobbled onto the arts, then it's everybody's technology center. If it's a center for, for example, ethics or one of these topics that maybe you might be thinking about, then nobody owns the disciplinary territory. Everybody is cut from their own anchor and they come to a new center and they have to start having real discussions about some of the real serious world problems that are cropping up from very unexpected places. So um, in my research, this is what I've noticed. Space needs to be agnostic and it needs to run 24 seven. Hmm. Great. Yeah. Kevin. A couple of quick 
I think unrelated thoughts, but um, first one is this. Uh, when I came to America for the first time 25 years ago to do my postdoc, I went to Boston to an institute affiliated with MIT called the Whitehead Institute. Uh, it had been uh, established by uh, the late Jack Whitehead, the inventor of the first automated blood analyzer. And now, at, at the time, 25 years ago, there was the only other building that I could see anywhere from my window was illegal seafood. That was about it. Uh, now, if you go there in Kendall Square in Cambridge, uh, it's one multi-billionaire philanthropist trying to outdo the other. Next to the Whitehead is Eli Broad's Institute for Genomics. Across the road is the much maligned Koch Brothers Koch Institute for Cancer Research. And across the other side of the road is uh, the McGovern Institute by a former boss of mine, a publisher, a fabulous man named Pat McGovern. And it continues. But it's not just academic industries and, and uh, institutes that are growing there. Big Pharma can't get there fast enough. Novartis and Pfizer, because this is where the cream of biomedical talent in this country is, whether it's a, you're a geneticist or a neuroscientist or an immunologist. And academe, I think Big Pharma is realizing that they don't have all the answers. They've got to cozy up and become better citizens, corporate citizens, and more, more engaging with, with basic researchers because many basic researchers are not thinking about this research can end up in a drug. They're thinking this research can end up in a nature paper that will get me tenure. But that group has to... That group has, and I'm not knocking that either, but that, that coalition has to, has to work better together. I also think in my current day job in science publishing, and particularly in academic journals, there's a lot of, um, a lot of change coming, and uh, Peter is the editor of a journal that was mentioned briefly in, in some of his slides, but what you didn't hear is that that journal is what we call an open access journal, and the great thing about that model is it's a, diff it's a different payer system, but you can go to any article in Peter's journal, plus NTDs, neglected trop uh, tropical diseases uh, and read every paper, the whole thing, not just the abstract and where the authors came from, the whole text. And we in, in the chemistry business now are trying to explore and use that model a bit more. So improving access to research and improving the readability and accessibility of that research is a big, uh, is an important uh, thing we should be looking at as well. Great, thank you. Let's thank all our speakers for a wonderful panel conversation. <laughs> really appreciate it, really outstanding. I'm going to invite um, our host, Ben, up here to make some final remarks. And, and as I leave the stage, uh, first of all, I want to tell you how much I appreciate all of you joining in the conversation. And if you enjoy this kind of thing, I hope that you will continue to engage. And two events that I know that are coming up next month that I'd like to call your attention to. One is on Monday, March 24th, where we're going to launch a new uh, public lecture series called Paideia Connections where um, two faculty will give very brief remarks, about 20 minutes each, and then the last 20 minutes of the hour will be spent having you um, make connections between the two remarks that you heard from two entirely different disciplines. I hope that you'll join us. That, I think we'll be at four o'clock on Monday the 24th. And then the next day, Monday the 25th, is gonna be our um, Roy and Margaret Schilling lecture, and the speaker is gonna be Scott Simon from National Public Radio from uh, Weekend Edition. And if you uh, can get out of work a little early, you can come in the afternoon and actually uh, enjoy a uh, presidential inauguration. But I won't tell you who that is. Um, before I leave the stage, uh, I hope that you will join me in showing our appreciation to Dr. Ben Pierce for putting together a magnificent program. Thanks, Ben. Thank you very much. So I just want to express my appreciation to, to President Berger, both for moderating the panel and for being here throughout the symposium. Uh, he, he made a real commitment to be here and to be engaged throughout the thing. So let's all thank Dr. Berger. And, and let me personally thank all of our speakers and the artists. Um, they've been great to work with. You've done a great job and a marvelous job of, of uh, leading us in a great dialogue about, the, about healing, about medicine and, and healthcare over the next two days. So let's thank our, our speakers and artists one more time.